When I was 10, my mother decided that on a school holiday, you know, a one-day holiday, like Veterans Day, she would take us to the Art Institute. And like, you're gonna take my day off and take me to the Art Institute in Chicago? Yep, we're going. It just opened my eyes to art. I think that was maybe just that one day trip kind of transformed what I was looking for in life. David Allen collections, an incredibly wide ranging experience from certain areas. It's all about contemporary things. You know, the, the art, the sculpture, it's all made by people now. In Thailand, that's mostly what I'm dealing with now. I didn't used to. And in Bali, a lot of it's contemporary. It's what's made now. My own carvers are carving every day, you know, from whatever I'm giving them. And that's not deeply cultural. I'm going back and forth every day from these ancient cultures with their own language and tradition and everything else to the contemporary world. In Nepal and Japan, it's all about the past. It's all antique. It's all pieces that have been made for a purpose a long time ago and virtually all of them have been passed down through generations. The primitive cultures echo the foundation of our cultures. So these cultures and these pieces remind me of our roots. They're not that far removed. I mean, it's really interesting to see cultures that are in the middle of the shift. And I deal with lots and lots of collectors and traders and every one of them grew up in a village where shamans are their access to health and well-being and spiritual guidance to a great extent and where these objects have real power, power to keep you safe, power to access your ancestors. They all grew up with this, and yet they see another world which doesn't believe in that. We're probably still animist at some level, even the most sophisticated societies, because we're influenced by nature, we're influenced by what's in the air, by the current thoughts. It surrounds us and informs us. So the, the ancient stuff, or even hundred-year-old pieces, reflect something elemental. Both the ancestor pieces and the protective pieces reflect our, our concerns and our fears. Something I've, I've never quite figured out is, so I go out to all these dozens and dozens of cultures, contemporary cultures, languages. I buy what I like. I buy what resonates with me, buy what feels right or good. Somehow when it lands here, it fits with everything else. It's just, I find it bizarre almost. It almost doesn't matter what gets put next to something else. They, they meld. If you look at this, it's a female shaman piece. It's probably in the neighborhood of 400 years old, could be a lot older. It was carved um, rough. It's so like you can see the texture here, but it's been held and touched for so many hundreds of years by so many people that this part has all become smooth. People have held it during childbirth. They've held it when they've lost their babies. It has an energy, and I've, I've had dozens and dozens of people hold this. And inevitably, they say almost the same thing. I, usually women. Um, I say there's, there's such a deep mix of joy and sadness. The, the pain, the joy, it's, it all is, 
imbued into this rock. And it's probably been through 20 or 30 generations of, of shaman. So the, the backstory of my getting this piece is I have a close friend who's a, a really good collector in Bali. When I'm hunting, I'll look at thousands of pieces in, in a day, thousands. And I generally am going to good collectors, so they've already waded through thousands of pieces. And of those thousands, I might pick five or ten on a good day that are right for us. So I walked into his office and straight to this piece. I said, Tony, I want this. He said, sorry, it's not for sale. It, it, I, I, I cannot sell it. It's, it's, um, it came as a gift and um, it's, it's too precious to sell. Said, okay, I understand that. And four months later, you know, I've, having looked at a few hundred thousand pieces since then, I walk in and um, it was in an, another room, but I didn't recognize it. But right to the same piece. It's like, oh, Tony, tell me about this piece. He said, you said that last time. Well, this happened three or four trips in a row because I don't have a memory for 100,000 pieces every, every trip. And <laughs> on the fifth trip, he said, I can't sell it to you, so but I can give it to you. So here's a gift, this exquisite piece, which has been on my desk or behind my desk for like seven years. And it's one of the very, very, very few pieces in the collection that I cannot and will not sell. Someday, um, she'll find a home, but I'm not looking for that, but there'll be, at some point, I won't have a choice. Somebody will walk in and it's theirs. There's nothing I'll be able to do about it. And I've done my job as the, um, what's the word? Caretaker. Uh, everything has, everything has great stories. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it gives a sense of the essence of our humanity to, to know and honor those stories. Because it's, it's people that are alive now, people that have healed people for hundreds and hundreds of years. My work seems to be sharing beauty, finding beauty, sharing the beauty of our differences, sharing the amazing in inventiveness of human beings as we create, as we live, the diversity of the cultures, the, you know, the beliefs, all that stuff's great. And to be able to see it firsthand and then somehow bring it here, it's a major treat, opening a world that most of us don't get to travel in. Somehow it does all come back to beauty though, for me. Beauty affects us. I mean, people like James Hubble have spent their lives sharing beauty and the essence of beauty in a way that we understand that it's important. That's why nature is important. People don't get out in nature. It's the ultimate beauty. To lock ourselves away from, from beauty is to kill our essence at some level. I sometimes watch people walk in the front door for the first time and they'll just stand there because there's a lot to take in. A lot of energy, a lot of excitement. 